Hello everyone and welcome back to another Photo Mishmash, your weekly source for any and all things photo. I'm Christina. And I'm Toby. And this is episode 30. 30. The title is Awkward Form Fact. Macro, macro, macro. Macro, macro, macro. So, as you know, I only got out one video so far this week, and it was the macro video. That's right. Um, it's put a lot of work into that. I put a lot of work into that, and you know, it's it's a little frustrating how long editing still takes me. I uh, definitely, well, it just takes a long time to edit a video like that. Um, but I'm happy with it and uh, great and good getting good comments on it. And we have a couple of questions uh, that we'll hit in the reader, or at least a question we'll hit in the reader section that kind of ties in to the macro. But if you have any macro questions, you should go watch that video first. It's as long as a podcast. I almost thought about putting it up as audio only, but there's a lot of it that's very visual. So I'm probably not gonna do that. But I think from time to time, I might throw up some of my more discussion-oriented videos um, into the podcast stream. Let me know what you think about that, if you'd be interested, or if you just want pure podcasts, only podcasts. So, uh, one correction to last week's, well, a couple of, can I just dive right into the next section of? Dive right in. Um, I mentioned last week talking about macros, the 180 millimeter, and I misspoke saying that it offers greater magnification. No, it still only offers one-to-one. -one. Scott corrected me. Thank you, Scott. Uh, it, what it allows is for one-to-one -one at a greater distance for your sub from your subject, so even more appropriate for things that are skittish like bugs. Uh, so you can hit that one-to-one -one and still be far enough away that you're not scaring them. The shorter the focal length you go to with a macro lens, the closer you have to be. Uh, and if you want to go more than one-to-one, -one, you can do it with extension tubes and a macro, or you can go up to Canon's very fancy, very cool MPE-65. It's a 1 to 5x macro, so it can take things to five times life size. And I just pulled up a couple pictures of things uh, that people have shot with it. You know, you're getting down to individual facets of a bug's eye. And it's not that expensive, but it is quite a specialized lens. So. so you should be excited um, that Hyperlapse is coming to Android. So I now am. you'll hopefully stop telling yep. me to install it on my phone all the time. Well, you did You did even make room. She's got three gigabytes of space now. Leave a comment down below if you think in that three gigabytes of space, she could install Hyperlapse so that we all can experience it as a group. Spoiler alert, I'm still not doing it. <sighs> um, what if we get you like 50 new likes on your Facebook page? Um, maybe. No. <laughs> oh, you're so stingy. Um, I just, I but, don't want to buy yes. like And somebody mentioned this, but, I, and, um, you know, I did hear that it is supposed to be coming to Android, but what I've heard now officially is that with Android L, the next version that's coming out in the next couple of months, uh, there are API changes to the camera setup and, um, that it will be able to support the kind of the gyroscopic abilities that makes Hyperlapse special. All right. So that's exciting. I also have to say, in a slightly photo related but more nerd related is that the new successor to the Moto X is announced. It's been my phone. I really want a good um, camera in my cell phone. Mm -hmm. And get an iPhone. I know. And now people are gonna say there's perfectly good ones in Android. There are in some of them, but, but they're not as good. But um, well, no, there are some that are as good and even slightly better, but I don't want those phones. I don't know what I want. I just want a good camera. Well, I have the nice heard... thing about the iPhone camera, it's not just the camera, but also the screen's really nice. And... Ooh, you're starting to talk about stuff you don't know about because some of those screens in the newer Androids have a higher pixel density. They're I'm very not talking nice. about pixel density. I'm talking, talking about... about the actual colors displayed on the screen. Mm, okay. Like I compare my screen to yours. Yours is like way bluer. Mine's way more natural. Okay. Looking. Well, that is just the Moto X, which isn't known for its amazing screen capabilities or screen resolution. It actually sure. came out as a little bit behind the other Androids at the time. Or we're going down too much of a path. But I did know and hear that the number one reason or the number one feature of cell phones for most people is the camera. Makes sense. It does make sense. It also makes sense why point-and-shoot sales are plummeting. 
or have plummeted, fallen off the precipice. All those little point shoots are like little lemmings marching right towards Just the cliff. Just like lemmings. Just like lemmings. All right. Um, well, I'm not sure why this is in the weekend review, but uh, one of our readers, Giuseppe, submitted an article from the BBC, or I guess it's sort of like a show or just clips. Um, I think it came from a show. Did it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's videos of, uh, well, it's not of cats, but uh, somebody strapped harnesses to cats with cameras and um, monitored the cats' activities throughout the night, throughout the day sort of see where they go. GPS and, and cameras. GPS yeah. and cameras. Well, I had to pad pretty interesting. I had to pad the weekend review a little bit and I also like taking a few moments to go back to last week's podcast and talking about the interesting comments um, that we received. And we had talked about the dog GoPro harness. Oh, I see. Which I have seen one video since then. Um, I wish I could find that and pull that back up. Maybe I'll try to. Where this guy, it's, I'm pretty sure the dog is wearing one of the new GoPro harnesses. Um, and he is way up high, not like in a plane, but way up this pathway. And he lets him go and he's like, go! And this dog just takes off running for like two minutes flat. And he clearly knows where he's going. He's going down these pathways over this rockiness, then over this rocky beach. And he's like... And then he just runs past a group of people and just jumps into the ocean. It's really cool because how far he runs. So that was an interesting use. But anyway, Giuseppe was feeling bad for us because we said we'd kind of like something on cats. Yeah. And he passed us along. It's a little GPS tracker. So nice. Giuseppe. Plus um, video. It was fun to watch. Yeah. So there's a link down below if you're interested in cats and where a group of English cats goes during their day and evening. Um, someone made a comment with regards to our discussion last week about uh, wedding photographers, specifically uh, Joe Businick, the celebrity wedding photographer that we took. So I'm just going to read his comments. Okay. So, um, so he says, um, I don't like com commenting before finishing the podcast, but I had to comment on your thoughts <laughs> on Joe Businick. He's a celebrity photographer. There are people who hire wedding photographers and there are people who hire Joe Busenic, a photographer who happens to do weddings, if that makes sense. They hire him specifically because of who he is. He basically was the only non-family witness at Kelly Pickler's wedding and he dictated the whole ceremony. He's a different breed from the usual wedding photographer. I'm not really sure. These are just my comments. Um, I'm not really sure what... Uh, reading the or dictating the whole ceremony really has to do with wedding photography. So he wasn't there as a wedding photographer, or well, I think he was, but he also got to say, "Here's how this is going to work." Oh, this I, is see, time. I see. Okay, got it. So you know, I, and I understand. We we understand the concept of celebrity wedding photographers. Um, I just wasn't aware of this guy Joe. But it is. I think it's important to to you know for yeah. some people to know that there are quite a few successful people out there who are more successful. For being successful than for right. the pictures they produce at weddings yeah yeah so thanks ej for um shedding some light on that um who's kelly pickler is she um we've had this conversation oh <laughs> i've asked who she is before yes you have what was the answer um she was uh somebody who was on american idol oh okay yeah. superstar <laughs> So that was the week in review, everyone. Oh, you know what I just just heard um, connect to this is, you know, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. This is now the uh, People podcast, uh, People magazine. Oh, yeah. Um, got married, and Wonderful. they sold the rights of their images to Getty for shopping out, um, and they took all that and put it in charity. I find kind it... Kind people. Well, I know. That's what they should... Do. Well, you know, who's to say what they should do? They certainly can do whatever they want with their money, but I think they have enough that, as they figure too, it's nice to go to a charity. It is their charity, but still, it's charity. Um, and I just, I just find it interesting that so much money is exchanged for celebrity photos, which almost oh, yeah. brings us to our news story, but that's not our first news story. Are we ready that's to okay. move on? We can move on. We've definitely moved on from the weekend review, I think, at this point. Okay. I have props for the next, for the news. Oh, boy. Okay. So go ahead and lead us in. Um, 
I'm not sure what we're talking about. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I thought we were gonna talk about the. Oh yeah, that. All right. Well, let's just jump around. Um, so you celebrated a year with your 70D what, last week. Yep. Very exciting. Have you said, let's move into the news yet? Let's move into the news. Boop, 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 boop. Newsflash. <laughs> Canon cannot fix my 70D. Now, I'm not saying that is in, I should say, they haven't been able to fix my 70D. So as Christine was saying, but I want to tell the story. Um, because I got to talk to the tech on the phone. Uh, you know, I celebrated my one year anniversary with a 70D apart. We had to celebrate it apart because my 70D was in New Jersey at the Jamesburg, New Jersey Canon Factory Service Center. It has since come back. The reason it was there, for a quick catch up for anybody who wasn't following, there are some 70Ds that seem to be affected by a center focusing point issue. That being the center focus point when used through the viewfinder or quick autofocus in the LCD, which is the same system, uh, is wildly and widely inconsistent in getting sharp focus. Other focus points around it, okay. Live view focus, okay. Nails 10 out of 10 shots. Don't you mean, don't you mean um, optical? When you're looking, it's when you're looking through the viewfinder that it that it's yes, or inaccurate. using quick autofocus and see, live view because that's the same system. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and mine seems to suffer from this issue. It's really hard to tell how widespread this problem is. I've got other videos and we've talked about it before, so I'm not going to go in too deep. But I had heard from Ruby that he had had the issue, and the way he got them to fix was to send along a lens and say, "Look, you'll see this issue if you shoot out about 30 feet." and you know wider apertures. So I sent along 51.4. We have two copies of a 51.4 from Canon. And one we, one we call a bad copy and one we call a good copy. Yep. He sent the good copy. I sent the good copy, so that's important. So it came back and immediately, um, well first thing I thought was interesting is it said center focus your product has been examined and it was found that the AF assembly did not operate properly causing rear focus. The AF assembly was replaced. I was like, yes, that sounds like it fixed it. And then I looked at the paper and thought, wait, wait a sec, this is about, it says focusing assembly USM. That's the lens. Yeah. This is, this piece of paper is about the lens. So a 51.4 that we've used extensively, tested lots of times and found to be good. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll talk more about 50s too. Um, was it Diego's question a little bit later on is a, is a good question that we'll talk about more. Um, found to be fine, they found that it was rear focusing and they replaced the whole autofocus assembly. Which it is does bizarre. Look, it does look very nice and clean now. Definitely. Then I pulled up this piece of paper and said, well, this must be for the 70D. Your product has been examined and upon close inspection, the exact cause could not be identified. Mm. But it was found that causing front focus from time to time. Yes, I didn't misread that. It's just poor English. But it was found that causing front focus from time to time. When the tech was reading this back to me on the phone yesterday, he paused too. and was, I felt his embarrassment slightly. Electrical adjustments were carried out on the AF assembly. That's the same thing they said before. I really think they just put that there. Product functions were confirmed. Clean sensor. Well, thank you, Canon, for cleaning the sensor. I don't feel like it was that dirty. Uh, all this is free because it's still under warranty. So that, that's the good news. Uh, but the bad well, news the 51 is... the 51.4 wasn't under warranty and that was free too, right? Oh, yeah, that's true. The 51.4 wasn't under warranty and they just fixed it. Um, so... So thanks, Canon. Thanks, Canon. We're fixing something we realized was broken. Or didn't feel like was broken. So I immediately, as I started to say, put that lens on the camera and started shooting a bunch of shots and thought... It's not any better. And, you know, tried to settle myself down a little bit because I was like, this is not what I want to spend my afternoon out on. But, well, you did. but I did. I spent just shot after shot after shot using that center focus point. I had a stretch of them where they were in focus pretty consistently. And I was like, gosh, they are. But then, you know, I don't know. I can't tell if it depends on how warm the camera is or what. But then I just had a string. 10 out of 10 shots that were widely out of focus. And again, this isn't consistent front or back focusing that can be fixed. So I called Canon guy. He sounded young. He was very nice. 
but he sounded young. And what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he well, he sounded like he is very good at helping beginners figure out how to turn live view on on their camera. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, he you know he had they he, you know. And it's because of his age. No, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be ageist because I'm young too, aren't I? Um, anyway, so. Uh, he sounded inexperienced as a tech support person okay, at Canon, but different. he was very nice and he worked hard at being helpful. His name was Luke. Luke, are you watching this? Because we did talk about my YouTube show uh, and uh, pointed him towards the blog post I originally did about all this. According to him, he's n he hasn't heard anything about this. I believe him. It sounded sincere. Uh, but it is interesting to me. It makes me think that this issue isn't that widespread and or compounded by the fact that you don't really notice it unless you're looking for it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if there are copies, if there's just bad copies. Yeah. Like there were just some And that was his point. He said, well, look, he said, you know, hundreds of thousands of cameras are rolling off the line. There's going to be some that are bad. Uh, you know, uh, reports in Germany, I've heard people say as many as 70% are affected. It feels really... Who came up with that That's number? right. Who came up with that number? It's so easy for things to get blown out of proportion. Yeah, but right. clearly... There are more than a couple cameras that are affected by this issue. So long story short. Well, long story short, I do want to tell this part about where he's like, at one point he's like, okay, well, let me, let me check with my resources. And, you know, he, like he's going to go check with a binder or something. And then he came back and he's like, well, I talked to my, uh, well, I checked with my resources. <laughs> Basically, he went to the higher ups. Um, and, you know, I think they asked him some questions to ask me, I told him, you know, basically just trying to get rid of variables because there are so many variables when, when people call up. I'm sure it's a frustrating thing and saying, I got blurry pictures. Why? Did you right. focus correctly? Yeah. Did you shake the camera when you took the picture? I mean, that's, that's an issue. Uh, but he's going to call me back. I don't know why I have to wait for it. He's going to call me back today. One of the things I asked is, is it possible for me to talk to the technician when they have the camera in hand? Because these people like Luke, Aren't, they aren't the ones that do any of the repairs. I think you know that. Um, and he said, well, no, it's really kind of a triangle. You know, I'm in the middle. And then I asked him if he'd seen the movie Office Space because there's that guy who's like, I'm the people person, damn it. Um, and he said he did see that. And he liked the part where they took the printer out and bashed it up. And I said, do you do printer support? And he said, no, but there are a lot of printer support people in the building with him. I don't know. The story's going downhill. Yes. <laughs> so long story long short. Short. He's going to call me back, but there is a chance that I'll be able to talk directly to a tech because he asked me if I was a CPS member. I am not, but you are. I said, well, my girlfriend is. And he's like, that's close enough. <laughs> so if all of you have issues out there, just tell them your girlfriend, Christina, and your CPS number. Uh, CPS stands for Canon Professional Services. And that is something you pay for each I year? Do pay for is that a yearly fee? Yeah. There um, is a free membership. I think you have to have a certain number of lenses and camera bodies to be able to qualify for it. Um, but there's different levels of membership. Silver, there's gold. And bronze. Mm -hmm. I think bronze might be the free one. Silver is, I think, $100 a year. And gold is $500 a year. And basically what you're paying for is two free clean and checks. Well, for my plan, should I have the silver? It's two free clean and checks. And then also when you need to send in gear to be repaired, they will expedite the process and ship it back to you right away so you can have it right away before the next shoot. So they expedite the repair process and, um, you know, sort of prioritize yeah. people and they can who have loan, membership. They can loan you gear too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and you get um, you get to try certain products too at some kind of discount. Um, hmm. Nothing terribly impressive. It's not like no, oh my gosh, not really. This is awesome. um, but no, actually, you don't. I, what I meant is that you get a discount on the repairs. That's what I meant. Oh, okay. That's where yep. the discount comes from. Yeah. So anyway. Okay. Um. Yeah, let's move on to our new next news story. Okay. Uh, we were going to talk briefly about um, iCloud because it's of been that in the news bit lately. Celebrity leak, leaked uh, photos, and uh, coincidentally, I yesterday none of my pictures were leaked or anything. <laughs> I mean, anyway. We could make um, no, so many jokes. My phone, he, he mentioned that, you know, I have three gigabytes of space on my phone. And 
that I freed up three gigabytes by um, just basically moving some pictures to my computer and, and then deleting those from my phone. But basically, it was really, really tricky for me to figure out really which pictures were the ones that were going to stay on my computer and on my phone and which ones were going to be in the cloud permanently and temporarily. It's just, it was really unclear to me because whenever I take a picture on my iPhone, it um, saves to the camera roll and it saves to the photo stream or that's what it used to do anyway. Um, and so according to whatever I read yesterday, when you take a photo and it saves it onto the photo stream, that only stays on your phone for like 30 days unless you save it somewhere else. And then it gets deleted. And so I didn't want to lose any of the pictures that I've taken in the last like three, four years. Um, so I couldn't really figure out really how iCloud worked. Like I know a lot of pictures are on iCloud of mine and some pictures on my desktop. And so anyway, it was just really confusing. So I can totally see why, you know, Things like this might happen and, and of course you know the big issue here is just how were the hackers able to really get into these accounts in the first place but I think that there's a lot of confusion well, well I think that's that yes I'm pretty sure that most of these celebrities you know we definitely don't want to go down this road too far and, and talk details um, but it's clear that I think most of these celebrities really uh, don't want these pictures out there and if they had known how the system works, because I think in the most recent version of iOS, problem here is we both don't quite know what we're talking about. Um, but in the most recent version of iOS, when you set it up, you also are prompted repeatedly to set up an iCloud account. And so it does start right. to do that. And that's a helpful thing because you hear these horror stories of people a couple years ago lose their iPhone. The one guy, all of his baby pictures, right. gone, because that was the only thing he had been using. Yeah. Um, to take pictures on. And so in that respect, it's great to have this kind of no-think solution that backs your system up. But it is kind of confusing. And this is something I think Apple's never been really good at, this cloud kind of stuff. Um, and they're getting better. And, you know, I have up here how this new iCloud photo system is supposed to work. But, and we're also not picking on Apple necessarily because there's, if you were on Android, if these celebrities were on Android, I'm sure that, uh, they yeah. could have been using Google+, Plus, which does right. automatic backup. Yeah, and I think... So what's our point here? <laughs> well, um, well, I don't know. I mean, what has been, for the viewers, what has been your... Do you use iCloud? Um, what has been your experience in terms of managing your photo library? I your, mean, your I didn't mobile have to, photo library, right, we yes, should say. Right, your mobile photo library. Yeah. I haven't done an update on my phone like I had a, an outdated version of the software because I couldn't make enough room or I didn't have enough room to uh, to download that the update and then to update it to update the phone um so that was my fault I mean I could have done this a long time ago but at the same time I would I feel like I shouldn't have to at this day and age based on you know, the, uh, what would you call it, the convenience of having iCloud and what they offer. I don't feel like I really should have to be spending too much time trying to think about which pictures are on my computer and then are, that are going to be backed up, which pictures are on my phone that I might potentially lose, what have you. Um, you know, I feel like it should be a lot more seamless and a lot easier. So, you know, what has been your experience? Uh, do we just not, can you point us to an article if you have had Don't success? Don't say we. All right, me. Um, if you have had success managing your iCloud library, is there, what, what do you yeah. do basically? Yeah. Okay. Or have and, you, the, and the reason why I, you know, I stay, don't say we kind of snarkily is because on Android, um, I'm really happy with the Google Plus setup. The, the way it backs up, goes online, there's this beautiful interface that I can use, not beautiful, good enough interface, and it, it, it seems to work really well. I also run Dropbox, so as I take pictures, and the thing that I like is even when I use my iFi cards or when I'm using one of the Wi-Fi enabled cameras that we're, that we're reviewing, um, and those images come over, both Google Plus and Dropbox both um, often snag those as well and slurp them up to the cloud. Um, so, um, 
you know, that works well for me and it seems pretty clear and I like it because a web interface to me is one of the best ways to access and then I can share those out if I want or I can just look at them, or I can delete them, uh, all of those things. And But knowing that if my phone literally burst into flames the second or I dropped it in the toilet, I'm not going to lose a single picture. Right. Right, which isn't a nice idea of iCloud, but just trying to figure out that whole 30 days thing. Mm -hmm. We could just be confused about that too, so I don't know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Am I just like not really, right. I don't know what I'm talking about and I don't haven't been looking at the right, right. stuff or, or right. is there really a general confusion right. on how to use everything? Yep. Um, now, you know what is, well, no, no way. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just move on to the next thing yeah. then. Um, Sony announced a new product. Well, not really a new product, but an update to a product that they'd released previously that nobody really had any interest in. And That's it's right. called Where the Sony it? Q, right? That's right. And the premise of this is um, sort of a, a Bluetooth enabled, uh, what, camera sensor um, that you can just set up onto your phone and you can use a wide range of Sony lenses. Um, I believe there's a, a what is the, the mount? It's an E-mount. It's, yeah, there are two, right? The other one. There are two mounts. No, the other one is, is a camera itself. So um, lens and. Oh, I see. Yeah. So there's the QX1 and the QX30. Now Sony announced, you know, there were earlier versions of these earlier this year. I don't think they came out last year. And it's kind of a neat idea. It's basically a sensor um, and uh, a lens that kind of clips onto any phone, does not use your camera, but it just uses your phone as, I don't know what I do with my phone. As an LCD screen. As an LCD screen, as the interface. And the, the show title, Awkward Form Factor, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in a second. So, you know, it's a neat idea because very lightweight and now they've taken a step further and said we're going to ditch the whole lens part just give you a mount with a nice it's the same sensor as the sony a6000 a7 but aps-c size sensor um, so very very high quality sensor you stick whatever sony e lenses you want on there and there's a good number and we'll talk in our next story about how you could even get canon lenses on there so I mean, interesting to you at all? Here's this pretty small, basically it's the size of a lens mount, not much more. Let's switch over to that one. Um, that you then stick on. You could stick on a nice little Sony 35mm yeah. prime. It's sort of interesting to me. I, I mean, I don't think I will get it, or I would get it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, what if Canon made this? No, still, I don't feel like, I don't really have an interest for it. I feel like um, I'm just happy taking pictures with my iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It's mm -hmm. sort of a challenge, I mean, sometimes. I guess if I wanted to zoom in and compress a little bit of the background, that would be, yeah, you know, I, maybe I would. Maybe I would consider it. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if Canon made one of these, the, the issue here, though, yeah, would, and where the... Why just Canon, like Sony? Well, because we already have Canon lenses. True. Okay. That's, you know, so if we could then throw the uh, 70 to 200 on there, as I was being silly at the beginning of the episode. Um, that would be, that would defeat the whole purpose of this. Like the whole purpose of this is so that you don't have to bring a ton of, you know, huge photography gear with you. You just bring like this tiny thing that if you need to take a picture, you just hook it onto your phone and that's it. But as a lens mount, it's, you know, it needs a lens. So... Yes, but you can pick you... a much smaller lens. That's boring. Sure. Uh, the, the whole point is that if you're going to be bringing your 70 to 200 along um, for, you know, hypothetically, then you may as well just bring a full-on camera. Like, what's the point? Well, the point is you're probably going to have your phone with you anyway, and a phone, if my you're... phone at least, is a whole lot lighter than a 5D Mark III. Yeah, but it's, I mean... If you said the 50, or if you said something okay. smaller, I hear you, but really the 70 to 200, mm -hmm. or you're just trying to be. <laughs> well, I was trying to take it to the extreme, okay. but I do think, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons we have liked, or one of the reasons I have liked or disliked some of the mirrorless cameras is how it feels in your hand. And I really, this is, does not feel like it's going to be 
a nice form factor for shooting. It's going to be awkward. Um, you're basically going to be holding the lens and manipulating the cell phone because you're not going to be able to just hold the cell phone and all of that stuff be clipped on there nicely. But I think it's an interesting direction. Um, and, you know, this kind of modularity. We've, we've heard rumors of this. Google's been working on this very modular phone where if you want, if the utmost importance to you is the camera, then you can buy an upgraded camera and slide it in there. Uh, and so this is kind of, kind of a step in that direction, and it's interesting. $400. That's not cheap, but again, you are getting in this a sensor that is the equivalent of a camera at least twice the price. You just got to bring your own interface to it. I also wonder what the lag situation is like, even if it is um, relatively short, because it's working by Bluetooth, I believe, um, or Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Um, so there's probably going to be some lag to it. We've seen in the, the GoPro, it's pretty laggy as far as you move your hand in front of that, and if you're using right. a uh, wireless device to view what it sees, there's a full second, maybe three quarters of a second delay. Something like the Panasonic GH4 found to be quite good. But if I was actually using that as the viewfinder solely, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, um, you sort of hinted at this uh, just a minute ago, but Metabones announced a new Speed Booster, the Speed Booster Ultra. So why don't you yep. tell us a little bit about that? Well, so Speed Boosters are these lens adapters that typically allow you to take some kind of full frame lens and put on an APS-C or um, a Micro Four Thirds mount uh, and not only allow you to use those lenses on those smaller cameras, but because those lenses are designed for full frame, they've got Think of it as a giant pipe that you're sitting onto a little pipe, um, the sensor of the smaller camera. They do some magic in that they focus the light and actually can be a faster lens. So maybe that lens, let's say you wanted to shoot with a Canon 51.8. When you stick it on, stuck it on this adapter on a Micro Four Thirds, you can actually shoot at f1.2. It's pretty nice. Yeah. We've I've reviewed them before. Uh, they've they have, they're up to like Mark 6 now, and this is Mark 6 Ultra, I believe is what it's called. And they have it in tons, tons of different mounts, and they range in price from four something to $600. Uh, they're neat, and I thought it was fun, and it kind of ties in with the last story because they do make a Canon to E-mount. So we could buy that Sony, and then we could stick a Speed Booster Ultra on it, and then I could stick my 70 to 200 on there. And it would be the most well, awkward what thing. What is it? A $1,000 later, you yes. can stick your lenses on there? That's true. I can stick my lenses for $1,000. Is this a bargain? For $1,000, you could stick your Canon lenses on your cell phone. Hmm. Hmm. No. So, that's interesting. There's yeah. other ones. They have a so, lot of different versions of that. Yeah. They don't have, um, and, you know, this would make me start to consider the GH4 even more. They don't have a one for the uh, GH4 because of uh, spacing issues there, I believe. I've heard some people have gotten ones to run successfully, but you might hit the shutter. So, so um, Roy, was it Roy? Yep. Who's in one Roy. Of our viewers, Roy. McKee, he submitted a really cool article about, um, well, of smoke photos. Yes. So um, from Petapixel, this guy uh, worked for three months capturing smoke photos, 100,000 images, and he took, I think, 20, what he calls 20 keepers. Wow. That is a significant low <laughs> keeper rate. I was wondering where you were taking it. <laughs> um, but you know, not not saying anything bad. And there, it's interesting if you go down and read the comments. People are like, you know, this seems a little ridiculous. I could, I've got pictures almost as good, and somebody posted one that was almost as good. But then people picked it apart. His are they're good. They are um, they're really good. They're really good. Uh, his, I'll tell you what though, his website isn't my most favorite. Let's see, this one is kind of cool. Um, because his... That's really cool. It is. They are very cool. Um, but what, you know, I don't love is that the navigation is right in the middle of the picture. Oh, I see. You have to roll your hand off for it to go away. And then, uh, well, you just click the next one. Um, oh, it went away fast. Okay. So he's got some really cool ones, as you see here. 
uh, and I think that's interesting. Now, a camera was destroyed in this process. Um, that's right. Or we shouldn't say that destroyed. It very much does. Um, the destroyed is a little bit of a link bait or, you know, and sensationalism. Basically, he had a shutter die on him, a shutter mechanism die. And that brought up the question. I think he had two different cameras. Um, and this is a question I get fairly frequently of, you know, you just shot that time lapse uh, when the T5 shot a time lapse of the T5i to see how long it would last. And, uh, you know, I got, what, 11,000 images. Somebody was like, you just used 10% of your shutter or maybe more. Uh, and that could be true. There is a database. I almost hesitate to share it with you all. Um, Here's the thing, though. Uh, I think, <laughs> well, thinking about the fact that for every single image, he used a flash. So was the flash fire directly at towards the camera? Was it... Um, I don't know. Well, I feel like if you're constantly so think, okay. firing, so did he do this constantly? Like he was just constantly firing a lot of pictures? Um, I, I think over a, if, a year period. All yeah. right. Well, but it was really I'm, just the shutter that died. Right. Oh, okay. the shutter, not the yeah. sensor. I yeah, see. the shutter. Well, what I'm saying is if you are using, if you were to do like several more of the same kind of time lapse that you did to do that test, mm -hmm. You, you're the likelihood that the shutter or camera would actually fail would be higher because you're, you know, the camera gets overheated. It's, you know, versus like just taking pictures or a normal amount of pictures one day and then the next day and then the next day. Does that make sense? Oh, yes and no. But here's, here's what I want to say that shutters and cameras have a life expectancy. Oh, I understand yeah. that. Yes. Um, and sensors, you know, sensors don't. Sensors can go bad, and there are certain things you can do um, that may uh, encourage them to go bad faster, but I don't really hear about that. It's really shutter mechanisms. It's a mechanical system in there, and most cameras, there are some now with electronic. Um, but, you know, there are only so many times it can open and close before the oil wears off and it grinds to a halt or something falls off of it. And the point I want to make here is that if you've bought a camera and you were using it to take pictures uh, and you want to do time lapses and you want to do lots of time lapses, don't worry about it. Use your camera for what you bought That's it for. Right. If the shutter fails, it can be fixed. Right. Uh, and I, I just, I feel bad for people who write me every once in a while and say, I'm really worried about this. It's not... You know, even if budget is a real big concern, I don't think it's worth worrying. It's about. worth worrying about. I mean, think of all the pictures that you would be I've sacrificing actually, because of right. You've you know. bought the camera to take pictures. Is my point here? Take right. pictures with it in whichever way you want to. Um, and in fact, I've never actually heard from somebody who has told me that their shutter has died. Um, just people worrying about it. And we have not had any shutters die. No. And we take a lot of photos. Now, the 5D Mark III is rated pretty high. It's actually not even in this uh, database. The 5D Mark II is. It's interesting. This is user submitted. So uh, this is basically a survey. And it looks like, um, you know, your survival estimate for the 5D Mark II is a quarter of a million to a half a million. Pretty good chance of getting at least that many pictures. Yeah, um, and I've definitely taken you know, at least that much, right. I think. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, there are there are apps that will tell you shutter count, and there's actually Not even a little Canon, Java. They've updated. There are some that work on Canon now um, that will tell you that. And there's some that have the information embedded in the image. Now, I'm not saying the file name because that will roll, roll over every 10,000 images, but embedded in the metadata of the image and some of these apps or uh, programs can pull it out and, and tell you. But my point is... Cool. To not worry about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, he created these amazing pictures, so I do think mm -hmm. he probably thinks it was worth it. I yep. think so, yeah. Yep. He didn't say what camera he used either, so it doesn't matter. Right, but, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, okay. So anyway, well, that was all of our news for um, this week. Let's move on to our discussion. Okay. Um, you wanted to, even though we've touched on it and talked about it in the past, you want to talk about Instagram. Well, I did in that... Um, it is, I, you know, I wrote a newsletter a few weeks back that said Instagram is currently my favorite photo sharing 
site. You have to put site in quotes because it's yeah, really an app. Mine too. Yours too. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that, and I just wanted to share those quickly. Um, one is, uh, one of the best ways to become a better photographer, this isn't so much a sharing about, but uh, consuming, is to look at a lot of pictures and to kind of decide what you like, what you don't like, um, and it helps kind of define your own style as a photographer to view lots of other images and also to be creatively inspired. Um, and Instagram is just such a nice way to consume photos. Now, the first thing I think I hear some of you saying is like, well, you know, I follow my brother and he posts pictures of his tuna salad. Uh, um, well, not my brother, but um, my brother, my just... brother posts cute pictures of his, his, yeah. his baby, my niece. My, my annoyance is people that post like only pictures of themselves. Mm -hmm. So here's <laughs> like, the thing. I'm certainly going to follow my brother. I like to look at those pictures, but I've chosen a lot of other really good photographers to follow yes. that are inspiring and produce beautiful images. Right. So that's one thing that I love about it. Yeah. What, what do you love about it? Or what do you like? That, about it? I like that about it too. I feel like, um, well, I feel like there's less of, in terms of social media um, in general, not just photo sharing apps and websites. I feel like, you know, I prefer it to using Facebook, which is if I were to share an image on Facebook, it's, uh, I don't know, you have to filter through so much more like crap that, you know, it, like there's way more noises on Facebook than there are on Instagram. It's, Instagram is more, you know, like people just share visual, yep. you know, they share imagery and there's less drama and there's less like... Oh, I want to see your Facebook now. <laughs> well, drama. no, there's no, some drama on my Facebook, but, you know, I just, like, roll my eyes so much. It's like, oh, this person's, like, bitching about this again. Or, you know, which yeah, I don't post on Facebook because I don't want to seem like that. But um, anyway, so getting off track here. But, yeah, I follow a lot of photographers that I really like. So it's great for inspiration, and it motivates me to kind of want to create, like, I don't just post anything. You know, I do would take time to plan a picture and to really think about the photo before just because it's Instagram and it's, you know, very instant and and it's displayed on such a small screen um, doesn't mean that I'm not going to, you know, make an effort to create a great photo. Mm -hmm. So it motivates me to, like, put a lot more thought into the photos that I'm sharing um, and, uh, and, and it's fun to just see other people's photos. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that to a point, though, um, because one of the other things that I like about it is because it's kind of the smaller screen form factor, a little bit less resolution. Um, all of the pictures that I put up there don't have to be perfect uh, or technically perfect. I want them to be good often, uh, and sometimes I'm okay with just sharing something that's interesting uh, and less of a good picture, but it takes that little bit of a pressure off, I think. Um, whereas if I'm putting something up on 500 pics, which is what I consider the gallery of some of my best work, for the most part, all of the pictures I put up there are, I feel like, some of my best work and are a very strong image. Whereas Instagram, it's a little bit more relaxed and it's a little bit more fun. But, I, you know, that doesn't mean I don't try to think about images. The other part of that, though, is the square crop. It's, it's fun. Yeah. It's different. Yeah, I agree. And, and I like shooting for the square crop. A lot of times I actually forget sometimes to turn it back at the beginning of weddings and I realize I shot the first half hour, 15 minutes in square. Uh, it's okay if you're shooting raw um, unless you've shot through the live view. Um, but it's fun to turn your camera to the one-to-one -one aspect ratio and then and shoot. It's, yeah. It has a different feel to it and I like that as well. So well, I'll put that list that I put in the newsletter down below of some folks that I recommend um, to follow if you're interested. And of course, we're down there as well. I don't know if I want to say anything else. Oh, well, I did say I, I do have this worry. Um, it is the only place I'm sharing images right now, but I do use all of those little social bits within Instagram to share out to Facebook usually, sometimes my personal page, sometimes the photo recommendations page. Uh, it goes to Flickr as well, which I have mixed feelings about, especially when I don't use a square crop and it gets the white borders on it. Mm -hmm. I really don't like that at Flickr, but I forget and it goes there anyway. And Twitter. And so I worry that 
sharing only in this spot these lower resolution images because they're not super high res, am I going to, in a year or so, look back and say, God, that was dumb. I stuck all that stuff there. It's all low resolution. But I realized as I was thinking about this that because 99% of the pictures I put there, I put there through uh, Lightroom to Dropbox to Instagram. That's my workflow. I have a video about that. And uh, it's a fairly high resolution. It's still not the highest, but it's a fairly high resolution that I put in the Dropbox, which then gets moved over to an archived Instagram folder that I have there. So actually, I do. The only downside is none of those there are tagged and titled like they are once they're on Instagram or Flickr. Yeah, my, my only annoyance is that I can't download those pictures. Um, and basically once they're in uh, they're on Instagram, you know, unless you share them elsewhere, then you can't download them back off Instagram. But yeah, I mean like you, I do my editing on the phone so I the photo does get saved to my phone um, regardless. So it's not like I, they're on Instagram and then, you know, if I want to print it or whatever, it's I don't have any access to it. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. What are your thoughts on Instagram? Is it annoying? Uh, and I also had comments from people, oh, I, and the other reason I want to put this in here is comments from people that don't quite understand Instagram. And, you know, I didn't at first either. Um, but one of the reasons I jumped in is because of how nicely it, you know, works with Facebook and sharing images. Because there's the filtering, amount of filtering that, in, that fil Facebook does to posts is a little discouraging. Uh, I wonder at some point when Instagram will start implementing some kind of filtering system too, but um, that will be frustrating when it does, I think. Uh, so, but you know, it is this app that really, there is a web interface now for viewing, uh, for liking and commenting, but it is really kind of bare bones mm -hmm. and there's no way to get images in other than through the app. Yeah. Uh, so you do need a smartphone or mm -hmm. tablet or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like, you know, Lightroom to Dropbox on Android. I open Instagram and there's the little Dropbox folder and it always goes right back to the same folder I've been going into, the Instagram folder that I made. And it's very easy to pull it out. So really think of it as a site you access through an app on a smartphone that's a place to share photos. And that's all it is to it. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Good. So we're gonna move on to reader questions now. Um, Samyak Jane um, asks, is the Canon 7D Mark II going to be a revolutionary 1DX all over again? Is this also part of the question? No, that was my little note to myself okay. that I thought was interesting. So for those who don't know, the 1DX is a serious camera, 18 megapixels, capable of 12 frames a second. And remember, you say, well, that, 12 frames a second has felt like it's gotten diluted a little bit because you look at the Sony a6000, which is capable of 10 or 11, there is a significant difference in autofocusing tracking. That 1DX is talking about shooting those 12 frames a second and tracking very fast moving subjects. One of the reviewers I was looking through, just to kind of get people's sense of what they're saying um, about the camera, is that they shot motorcycles moving at 130 miles an hour right by them using tracking autofocus, 12 frames a second, those guys were all in focus through every frame. Uh, the Sony a6000, we shot, you know, those burst rates and anything moving fast, you definitely get some frames out of focus. I'm not comparing these two cameras, but just saying that this is a serious autofocus beast. And the rumor is that the 7D Mark II is going to have some of these same internals. The answer is I, I hope it is. Uh, revolutionary feels like a really strong word. I don't feel like we've really had any revolutionary jumps in mini cameras in quite a while. It's just kind of been iterative. It's definitely better or noticeably better in this area or that area or that area. So let's say uh, image quality and low light or, well, you know what? I say that in the Sony a7's low light image quality is pretty revolutionary. So, so, um, I don't think it's going to be quite revolutionary, but I do think that it is going to be uh, a sports photographer's on a budget dream. Okay. Yeah. And wildlife photography too. 
Um, you, uh, Diego had a question about the 50 millimeter. Yes, let me pull, pull that up. Yep. Uh, pull let me read right another here. question, actually. I got it. Oh. Yep. All right. There okay. It is. So Diego wants to know, says, hiya, Toby. How are you? I'm good, Diego. Thank you. How are you? He's got a question for you. Canon is, Canon is so famous for offering the fixed 50 millimeter lens, f1.8 and f1.4, but both have poor MTF charts. And you can see the charts right here. Really bad specs, dot, dot, dot. So why are those lenses so famous? I had the 51.8 Mark II, and for those who knew, didn't know there was a Mark I and Mark II, there is. The Mark II is the one everybody has. The Mark I is really old. Uh, People don't really have them. It had the metal mount. They're not really around too much. And the 51 uh, F14 and sold them. No quote unquote outstanding results with them. Normal quality picks with my 100 millimeter macro F28L. Oh, totally. I take fantastic portraits and close ups. Look at these MTF charts. Yes. Okay. So we'll, we're working with like a little bit different sort of. Lens, well, really different lenses. So the 51.8 and the 51.4 are sort of the low and mid range, um, you know, level lenses, um, respectively. And, you know, the 100 millimeter macro is an L lens. So it's very, you know, the price is a lot higher than both of these. Um, and the image quality is also incredible. Um, you know, it's a prime lens and it's an out lens. So um, that means great quality. Um, and because it's a prime, then you're going to be getting, you know, a, and there's less moving parts and you're going to be or fewer moving parts. You're going to be getting better image quality. Um, that being said, yes, the 51.8 and the 51.4 are pretty, they're, they're not amazing lenses. I think people get them. And they're really popular. One because uh, you know, for it, they're better than a zoom lens. You know, in terms of giving you a little bit more creative freedom um, if you want to shoot at a shallow depth of field. And uh, um, they're also really popular focal lengths. Um, you know, setting aside all the optics and the technology, the it's kind of the you know they call the fifty what you would see with your eye, so, or, or the look of the 50, it's what you would see with your eye, you know, when you're not looking through a viewfinder or when you are looking through a viewfinder. Um, so I think it's more about the focal length really than the lens themselves. And yeah, I mean, the, the 51.4 is not, it's not a great, I, I mean, it's a great lens for the money, um, but it's not gonna compete by any means with the 100. and the 51.8 isn't either. Um, so they're different, you know, they're sort of they have different ranks um, for different reasons. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, I think a couple things. One is how to read an MTF chart. And this is another one of those skills that I hesitate to share because it can be useful to understand these charts, but it's, it's so easy to get caught up in numbers and you, and you look at them and once you understand what they're showing you, you can see a significant difference between the 51.8 and the 100 in this chart. But Diego, let me ask you, the 51.8 is $100. The 100L is basically $1,950. That is a huge price range difference. Humongous. And I'd suggest that maybe not at well, I would suggest that at 50 millimeters f2.8, the 1.8 probably doesn't do too bad a job compared to the 100, quality-wise. Really, what it offers for that money is, and you said this, it's a, it's a good value. So let's take a quick step back, though, and, and, and share how to read an MTF chart. So we're looking at these three charts right here. We've got thick lines, thin lines, dash lines, um, we have blue lines, we have black lines. Basically, let's ignore the lines for a second though and look at our uh, y-axis, the axis that goes up and down. The higher you are in the axis, basically the higher you can consider the quality to be. Our x-axis going across is a measurement from of, well, sharpness and contrast 
resolution and contrast from the center of the lens out to the edge. And I've mentioned this before, I just mentioned it in the macros. Uh, you know, things get softer out towards the edges of the lenses, especially in cheaper lenses, the quality degrades noticeably as you go out from center. Lenses are usually sharpest at their center. The blue lines measure at f8, which is in my sharpness video or how to get sharper images. I talk about sweet spots of lenses. And if you can shoot at f8 because of your situation lighting wise and you don't need to control your depth of field, that is going to give you the sharpest images. So landscape photography, f8 is great. What do the journalists say? F8 and be there. And so basically you can follow these little charts across to the right and you can see that as the 51.8 gets towards the edge, its sharpness decreases significantly. But for a nice portrait lens, and somebody just made this argument about the 51.2 on my other video of, 50, of the Sigma versus Canon, um, that you don't really care too much about sharpness out at the edge. And I shouldn't say you don't care, but for a nice portrait lens, it doesn't really matter. Um, and uh, the, well, the thickness line and thin lines uh, have to do with contrast versus sharpness or resolution uh, they show you in f8 versus wide open, their maximum aperture. Um, so I guess what I want to say is that for the money, these offer really good value. The 51.4, it can be argued, maybe not quite as good a value, um, but still, capable of taking really nice portrait shots. And no offense to you, Diego, but just because you didn't get any outstanding results with them doesn't mean that they're not capable of that. Uh, but you do have to walk this balance of not shooting them quite wide open. Yes, But absolutely. if you pay a lot more for a lens like the 100, which is a 100 millimeter f2.8 L, which is a fantastic lens, um, then you are able to consistently shoot wide open and get more contrast and um, more, um, what's the, well, a better resolution. Uh, and, you know, it controls chromatic aberration because of lens coatings and things like that right. as well. Yeah. That's not really factored into MTF charts though. So, right. um, so what I don't want people to take away from this fact is to go look up their lens. Let me go look up my lens and go, oh, it's, you know, it dives down out there. That's why I'm getting crummy pictures. It's well, here's the thing to think about. I mean, there have been so many photographs created with all kinds of lenses, you know, throughout history. Like, this isn't, an MDF shirt is not going to make a difference whether you take a good or a bad picture. I mean, it's all you, it's what you do with the gear that you have that's going to make the picture. So we can spend a ton of time talking about MTF charts, reading about reading MTF charts, stressing about a crappy MTF chart, or we can just take the gear that we have that, you know, we can afford that we can, whatever that you have in front of you and then just make pictures with it and, and do the best you can. I mean, a lot of times really soft images or not really, really soft, but images will come out right out of camera and be quite soft. So you may just have to apply a little bit more sharpening in Photoshop or Lightroom, you know, and that'll quickly correct. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that you're not really, how often are you going to be like zooming in and looking at every detail of the photo? Like mm -hmm. if you, even if you blow it up, you're going to view it at a distance where you're not going to be able to notice that and, and you're not, you're not going to notice it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, the 100 macro, is going to take much, much nicer photos for many, many reasons than the 51.4 and the 51.8. But you're also going to pay a lot more. Um, Carry around a heavier lens. Yeah, I mean, and and it's, I mean, it's a great lens. It's a great mm -hmm. portrait lens. It's a great yep. macro lens. Yep. Um, but they can't really be compared. Yeah. So. Right. I think it, it's hard to compare these lenses because of the price difference, um, but. And the reason, again, I think the simple reason the 51.8 is so popular is because it is a nice focal length, even on crop sensors, um, and it's so darn cheap yeah. and a good value. I'll say one more thing, and we're going to wrap this up completely. John of Sparta, we're going to get to your question next week. You had a good one on last week's podcast. 
is there any future in photography as a business? So we'll talk about that next week. But I want to say one thing I had recommended to somebody who was considering a Sony this week. I said, you know, get the 35. They were thinking of the Sony uh, A6000 crop sensor. Um, and I said, you know, 35, it's a nice portrait length. Uh, and I often say that to people who are beginners because the 35 on a crop sensor, like 1.6 or 1.5 is what, 50-ish? Mm -hmm. um, and that is a decent focal length for portraits, but it's also a little bit wide, so it gives it a little bit more versatility as kind of a walk around lens. But it's true that most of the portraits we take, we do take at longer focal lengths. Um, you know, the- well, it's easier. Why is it easier? It's just, you know, there's compression, uh, so you don't have to think about as hard about the background, um, about what's around you, uh, about how... I mean, it's easier to isolate your subject. Yeah, and you don't have to, like, you know, pose people so very carefully because you can, you know, like, crop out distracting elements. And so it's the easier choice. It doesn't mean that the, it's a better choice, right. but it's certainly... And, and when you have to be on your feet all day, like, coming up with... Or creating good portraits on a regular basis on the spot and you don't have a ton of control of the environment then they work really nicely mm -hmm. um, but you can totally create great portraits with a 35 even yes. on a full frame sensor you yes. just have to be a lot more thoughtful about what's in your frame yes. um, so going back to the assignments that we've given uh, to think before you click videos you know that's what those are all about you can still create great images you just have to be a lot more thoughtful mm -hmm. Um, it's not as easy to just like close in on somebody because if you do get close and you get you get in too close Then there's a lot of distortion. So Again, it's it's possible to do the same thing, but it's It's more challenging in the sense that you have to think about Everything that's in your frame and there's gonna be a lot more stuff in your frame Okay, okay. Are good. we gonna talk about uh, Janine Churchwell's question. Oh, yes, that is a good question. So I, I, have to a, I have a Didn't quick answer. We don't have to like talk too much about yep. it. Um, so she is wondering, for the same amount of money, would you buy the Canon 100mm Macro f2.8 or buy the Sigma 50 Art f1.4 and just use extension tubes if you wanted to go macro? I think overall the latter would be more versatile if one would normally shoot in the 50 millimeter range, but might want to go macro from, from time to time. What are our thoughts? I think I would, unless you're going to be doing a ton of macro, I would go with the 51.4. Yeah. Do keep in mind that you are going to spend a little bit more if you get the extension tubes and just buying the macro, but I do think there's going to be, it's going to be way more versatile and you're still going to get great image quality. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely the 51.4 and the macro extension tubes. Yep. 51.4 is so sharp, the Sigma 51.4 we're talking about now. Yes. Um, and uh, yes, well, I've been very happy with the results from extension tubes and good lenses. Uh, it, takes, it definitely takes a little bit more work and I miss that IS that the 100 offers, but I think we answer that question with what we've done and that is we wanted some capabilities, macro capabilities for ring shots uh, and other kind of wedding, very small wedding details. And we went with um, extension tubes instead of yeah. a dedicated macro lens and that seems, because we just don't do it enough. Right, and we don't do it enough and, and I wouldn't use that lens enough. So it, it seems yeah. like $900 is a little too much for just like one picture. I, I will say this though, macro photography and I, I was kind of surprised I didn't say this in the video, but macro photography is the one way, if you feel like you live in a boring place with nothing around you, you know, no real photogenic stuff, first off, you're not looking right. There is always stuff, but I can understand that feeling. I, I felt that way in places before. But you pick up a macro lens and suddenly your backyard is this amazing place full of spiders and cobwebs with dew drops in them and detailed flower bits and just kind of this whole amazing world opens up. Uh, so macro photography can be a lot of fun and if it's something you want to explore then macro lens like the 60 with extension tubes you can get very close um, and have a lot of fun with it at a fairly affordable rate. But you know if you don't really know or don't really plan to do macro work, then extension tubes can certainly fill the gap quite nicely. Yep. I think that's a good place to end um, this show. I agree.
Okay, we have our Flickr picks of the week that we'll put up right now. Christina didn't want to talk about them. She said, I just want to pick the picture. Um, yes, I threw you under the bus. I wanted to talk about mine, but since she's not going to talk about hers, I'm not going to talk about mine, except I just like the way the swoopiness of the sparks were. That's all. It's not a technically perfect picture, but I just liked it. So we'll say that. And thank you all so much for your comments and your thumbs up. They mean a lot to us. Take a moment to hit that thumbs up button. And if you haven't subscribed, do that too, please. Thanks. Bye-bye. Recording here and recording there. We've been recording everywhere. All this blibber blabber, extra cutout. It's 11 o'clock. Let's go. Hello everyone and welcome to another Photo Mishmash, your weekly source for all things. You want me to do it? No. <laughs>